Hey, everybody, real quick, before we get into Season 3 recap of the morning show, if you need a Season 2 recap, I've got you covered. Just hit the tab in the upper right-hand corner. It'll take you right to it. I also have a Season 1 and 2 recap. I combine both. You can just search my page for that one. Season 3 of the morning show kicks off in March 2022, basically two years after the end of Season 2 of the morning show. A lot has changed. Alex is no longer a full-time fixture on the morning show. She's a contributor. She shows up a few times a week. But now, her show Alex Unfiltered has been carrying UBA+. She does hard-hitting interviews, and that's what's been driving subscribers. But Alex has had to put that to the side because she's been training for a mission. A mission to go up into space with a billionaire named Paul Marks, who owns a company called Hyperion. Hyperion has built a rocket to send people into space to see what the astronauts see. His test flight is going to include Alex Levy. UBA is going to cover it all. As for Bradley, she's now doing evening news. Both of their roles have been filled with Yanko Flores, who's wanted this for a long time, and a former Olympian named Christina Hunter. She's kind of the total package. She's America's sweetheart, but she's also really, really good at her job. This has allowed Bradley to focus on more serious topics, which is what she's always wanted to do. And the topic she's currently trying to dive into is the abortion ban in Texas. Bradley's been able to connect with a woman who's been going over the border to get abortion medication to bring it over to the states for women who need it. She wants to bring her on and interview her, but it's been difficult to connect. But just like with Alex Unfiltered, Bradley has thrived in the role of Evening News. So much so that she's getting an award because of her coverage of the January 6th insurrection. Bradley was actually boots on the ground filming it, and she gave viewers a first-hand look at what was going on in the Capitol, risking her own life to do so. One person, though, who is noticeably absent from UBA is Laura. She's actually gone over to YOA, working hand-in-hand with the former enemy, Audra. But other than that, everybody's still there, and everybody's under the guidance of Corey. Not only is he still running UBA, he's trying to sell it off. And he's trying to do so to Paul Marks. Yeah, this whole Alex going up in space thing, it wasn't just for publicity. It wasn't just for the content. It was to buddy up with Paul Marks. Corey and Paul have been talking for a while about Paul buying UBA, but at the moment, they're at a standstill. They can't agree on price. The two guys meet in a sauna, and they try to convince themselves that they both need each other, but still, no deal is reached. Nobody, though, other than Paul and Corey know about this merger. To everybody working at UBA, the Alex Levy launch into space is nothing more than content. Going up into space, though, on some rocket's maiden voyage has Alex a little bit on edge. And every time she does try to contact Corey, she can't get a hold of him. So finally, she gets sick of it, and the day before the launch... She heads up to his office to have a one-on-one with him. That's where he lets her know that he's actually going to be going with her. He got invited by Paul Marks. But she didn't really come here to discuss the passengers on Hyperion 1. She came with demands. She wants to double her development slate. She wants profit participation. And most importantly, she wants a seat on the board. She feels like she's earned it. She's the main fixture at UBA. She single-handedly saved UBA+. And she's risking her life going up into this rocket. Corey is a little taken aback. And he lets her know that what she's asking for is unprecedented. And Alex says, well, I'm unprecedented. And if things don't change, I'll simply go elsewhere. She starts to walk out of the room and Corey stops her and says, Alex, I hear you. And I will make you very, very happy. Once Alex actually does walk out of the room, Corey has a meeting with the second most powerful woman at UBA, Sybil. The third most powerful woman at UBA is also in this meeting, Stella. Sybil actually called the meeting because she's gotten word from a bunch of heads and departments that Corey's been cost-cutting, and she feels like he's been cost-cutting to feed UBA+. In doing so, he's been drowning UBA in debt, and it's got Sybil pretty concerned. Stella jumps in and says, we can make this work, but I do want to sit down and talk about next quarter's projections because they're worse than we thought. Sybil tells Stella that she absolutely wants to look over those projections so she can get the expectations ready for the board. Corey and Stella leave the meeting together, and Stella tells Corey, well, Sybil's right about one thing. Our financials are horrible. I mean, do we need to talk about layoffs? 
And Corey brushes it to the side, telling her, don't get your LinkedIn ready just yet. Stella then heads down and has a conversation with Bradley, where she lets her know that Bradley's going to have to get rid of the abortion piece. Bradley, of course, does not take this well. She's been cultivating this source for a while to find out that she just has to brush the story to the side and get rid of it. Doesn't sit well with her. Stella tries to remind Bradley that now she's doing evening news, she has to be unbiased. And because of her past, this could be looked at as a biased piece. It's also a hot-button topic. This woman is breaking the law by crossing the border to get illegal drugs, bring them over to the States. It opens UBA up to possible advertiser boycotts. It's just not worth it. Bradley's still really pissed off about this. And Stella hammers home that with this next election coming up, they need the viewers to be able to trust Bradley Jackson. Doing this piece might put doubt into some viewers' minds if they can do that or not. Later that night, Bradley has her award ceremony. And she should be happy about it, but because of the abortion piece getting sidelined, she's pissed off. Even as she walks the red carpet, it's tough for her to muster a smile. She is surprised, though, to see somebody in attendance. Her old flame, Laura. It's a little bit awkward. Bradley at one point telling Laura, you know, this doesn't have to be weird. You know, I'm not mad or anything. And Laura chuckles and says, why would you be? I mean, if you had stayed in Montana with me, none of this would have happened. This sparks a little bit of an argument. Bradley telling Laura that she didn't want her to stay in Montana. And Laura reminding Bradley that Bradley pushed her away. The conversation is getting nowhere until finally Bradley just excuses herself to go get another drink. The person that Bradley really wants to talk to, who she hasn't had a chance to, is Corey. She's been waiting at the bar for him to show up, and when he finally does, she rips into him for sidelining her abortion piece. Corey reminds Bradley that news is Stella's department. He just doesn't interfere with the stories. So what Stella says goes. And Bradley asks, would you interfere if we were together? Is that what it would take? Corey, however, does not take the bait. He just grabs a drink and walks off. Because of her mood, when she finally does get presented with this award, Bradley kind of chucks her speech to the side, just telling the audience, there will always be someone who tries to silence you. Alex, who presented Bradley with the award, can tell that something's going on with her. And their relationship has gotten a lot better, so... Alex, as a friend, goes up to Bradley and kind of asks what's going on, and Bradley explains that she cultivated these relationships with a woman in Texas about the abortion problem, but the story got sidelined by Stella. Alex, though, does take Stella's side, but she does so in a way that isn't as confrontational. She tells Bradley that she's evening news. She's Dan Rather. You can't rock the boat with a story like this. Bradley looks at Alex and says, I just want my work to mean something. And Alex reminds her about all the big things that are coming up in the news. Supreme Court rulings, presidential elections. That work is going to matter. For the moment, you have to let this one go to enjoy those big stories. When she leaves the party, she calls up her contact down in Texas and says, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to make it. But a couple people who are heading to Texas are Alex and the entire morning show crew, because that is where Hyperion One is launching from. Shortly after arriving, they attend a party where Alex is formally introduced to Paul. Paul wants to get a one-on-one with Alex, so he takes her on a tour of the facility. But the reason why he wants to show her around is because he wants to get to know her if he's going to buy UBA. Alex, though, thinks there's an ulterior motive going on, and she asks him point blank, What are you getting out of all this? Because Alex has no idea about Paul's interest in buying UBA. Paul doesn't know that Alex doesn't know. So he says, well, if I'm going to buy UBA, I want to get to know you. And the fact that this is the first time that Alex is hearing about a deal between Paul Marks and UBA really pisses her off to the point where she kind of shuts down. When she gets back to the hotel, she confronts Corey about it. And Corey tells her, you're out of your lane. But she says, no, no, no. Screw my lane. You're pimping me out on a rocket ship so you can close a deal. This is exactly why I need to be a part of these conversations. And Corey loses his cool, screaming at her that they need somebody with deep pockets, just like Paul Marks, to stay afloat in this economy. Alex, though, doesn't see it like that. She doesn't agree, and she realizes 
he hasn't told Sybil any of this. The frustration for Alex, though, can only go so far at the moment since she is in Texas. The person she vents to is, of course, Chip. But while venting, she gets a text message from Bradley that says that her contact, Luna, got arrested. And Bradley's not going to sit back and allow her to sit in a jail cell. She's planning on heading to Texas, and she wants Alex's help on getting a camera operator to report on it. Alex, though, has a better idea. Instead of Bradley going, she's going to go. She's going to blow off the Hyperion 1 launch, sending a clear message to Corey and she's going to go report on Luna's arrest. The morning show staff starts scrambling, trying to find out where Alex is, and then pivoting to just finding an Alex replacement for the Hyperion launch. The person they decide on is Bradley. Corey meets her at the airport and explains there's nothing that Bradley can do for Luna at this point. He's called the legal department. They're going to help her out. But in return, he needs Bradley to get on that rocket ship. And he pulls a pretty big trump card, reminding her how he was there for her when she was trying to find Hal. When the morning show goes live a few hours later, they make an excuse for Alex, and Bradley is getting suited up. But Paul Marks is pissed, because he took what Alex did as a slight to him, not as a slight to Corey. That's because Alex never cleared up that her problem wasn't with him, it was the fact that she was unaware of a potential deal between Paul and UVA. And thus... Paul isn't too thrilled to see Bradley show up at command center. Either way, the rocket still has to go up. Everybody climbs inside and it takes off. Alex and Chip watch from a small Texas diner. When the rocket finally reaches space, the view is incredible. When it's safe, Bradley, Paul, Corey, they're all able to float around and enjoy the experience with millions of people down on Earth watching it live. Bradley is able to talk to the morning show and explain what she's seeing up there, what she's experiencing, and then the feed goes dark. In episode two, you find out that Paul Marks, Corey, and Bradley were taken by aliens. No, I'm just kidding. It was technical difficulties. They're fine. Bradley had no idea. She kept talking to the camera. And after a few seconds, the picture comes back up. But once Hyperion 1 lands on the ground, Paul Marks is pissed. He looks at Corey and UBA as botching this whole thing. It was their technical difficulty, and it was their star who didn't want to join him on the journey. Paul thinks this little error could cost him millions. The UBA team then gets ready to head back to New York, and it includes Alex, who has to face Corey for the first time. But she doesn't really care, and he tells her, Oh, I got your message, loud and clear. But she heads straight to the back of the plane to go talk to Bradley. Alex then fills her in on the whole Paul Marks buying UBA, and it doesn't sit right with Bradley. She looks at Paul Marks as an asshole. A couple hours later, everybody touches back down in New York City, and the first thing that Alex does is call up Sybil and have dinner with her, where she lets her know what Corey's up to. Sybil appreciates Alex's candor, but she's also pissed off with her for skipping the launch because advertisers are pissed. And Alex pleads her case, saying that that launch was nothing more than a show for a possible deal that would have killed UBA's credibility. But Sybil doesn't care about credibility. She's the head of the board of directors. She cares about one thing, and that's making UBA money. Alex sticks to her guns, though. She's pretty convinced of what Paul Marks will do, and that is fold the news division and turn the entire UBA company into an AI bot. At the end of the dinner... Sybil reassures her that this deal will not go through. The next day, when Sybil does meet with Corey and Stella, she doesn't bring up the Paul Marks thing. She actually brings up punishing Alex, which is tough to do because of how powerful Alex is. And Corey tries to explain that to her, but Sybil doesn't care. A message needs to be sent no matter who you are. And Stella comes up with a great idea, punishing Alex by making her do the morning show five days a week. At the moment, she's only doing it twice a week. It'll boost ratings, and it'll punish Alex. Everybody in the room agrees that this is probably the best way to handle the situation. They're discussing all of this while just a few floors down, the morning show is going on with Alex. But then, the morning show goes off air. Lights go off, doors are locked. Everybody's kind of freaking out because this is the protocol if there's an active shooter in the building. Chip gets really proactive trying to get talent to their dressing rooms and make sure that they're not freaking out too much. 
Bradley, however, isn't about to sit in her dressing room. She also wants to get proactive. And her and Chip decide to take the elevator to go find Corey or somebody who can explain what the hell's going on. They don't get many floors up until the elevator, though, shuts down. And they're stuck. The cameras, after about five, ten minutes, do eventually come back on. Some of the power comes back on. And that's when it becomes clear to the staff that there isn't an active shooter in the building. They've been hacked. Someone's controlling the system, and it's nobody in the building. Whoever's doing it is blasting rap music, and it's sending Stella, Corey, all the bosses into a frenzy. The IT guy in charge tells both Stella and Corey that who's ever doing this has the entire building locked up. It's going to take a little time to get everybody back on the air and figure out where this is coming from. But it goes from bad to worse, because who's ever in the system has everything, and they start emailing the stuff out, stuff like performance reviews, people's salary, what bosses think of talent. It's not good. These people have emails, text messages, pilots, film slates. You name it, if it was in the system, they have it. If your phone was connected to the Wi-Fi, they have it. They have access to a whole lot of stuff. But the thing that might be most damning of all is videos, pictures. And when Corey's assistant tells him to check his email, there's a video sitting there that Bradley made and she sent to Laura a while back. It was just sitting on her phone. And let's just say it's got Bradley in a compromising position that Bradley would never want this video to see the light of day. Poor Bradley, when she does finally get out of that elevator, she has no idea what's about to hit her. But somebody grabs her and says, Corey needs to see you right away. And when she enters the room, she's surprised because there's Laura. Corey felt like it was the right thing to do to contact both of them about this situation. It's a lot for her to take in at the moment, and she's kind of half listening to the room. Stella does mention that the good news is this video hasn't gotten out yet. The hackers are simply using it as leverage to get the $50 million that they've requested. As they're discussing all of this, Corey gets another email from the hackers, and it's literally the conversation that they had a few seconds ago. It tells Corey, Stella, really the room, of how serious this problem is. Because the hackers are currently listening to them, and they're every word. These people are really, really good. They're not playing games. Because of it, Stella starts grabbing cell phones and tries to hide them. But Bradley makes a beeline to the bathroom to just throw up. The idea that that video could end up getting out to the public could absolutely kill her credibility and embarrass her. Laura goes after her and tries to make her feel better, but in that moment, there's nothing that could make Bradley feel better. While those two were chatting in the bathroom, Corey and Stella went into damage control, and as is typical with Corey, he's been able to spin this into a positive, that UBA will have positive publicity because it's as if hackers are going after democracy and the truth. Stella, though, doesn't really see it like that. She sees this as a giant problem. She has to head down and collect all employees' cell phones just so nothing else gets out. Which doesn't sit all that well with them. They don't really want to give out their cell phones, but reluctantly, they do all hand them over. There was, though, one person who didn't hand over her cell phone. That's Mia. She sneaks into an office, closes the door, and FaceTimes a freelance journalist named Andre letting him know that the system's been compromised and he should back up all his files, not to email anything to UVA. But just through their interaction, you can tell these two have a history. Stella, though, doesn't know about this rogue cell phone. She thinks she's gotten them all. And after she does, she has to talk to Alex about the TMS punishment. Alex tries to pull the check my contract line, and Stella says, you breached your contract. You're going to be on TMS five days a week, thanks, and walks off. While Stella was collecting cell phones, handing out punishments, Corey figured that he might have an idea of who did this. Paul Marks. Paul's specialty is big tech. He would have the power to do something like this. He thinks that it was a possibility Paul did this to lower the price of UBA. He calls him up and without overtly asking, did you do this and accusing him of it, he basically accuses him of it. After hanging up on Paul... Corey goes back into his office, and there's Bradley waiting for him. Bradley had a little time to think about what else was on her cell phone, and she asks him if he told anybody about an incident a year ago. 
We don't know what the incident is. It seems like it was between the two of them. But Corey reassures her that he didn't tell anybody about it. His big concern right now is figuring out what to do about this ransom and how they're going to shut this video down. The stress, though, is really getting to Bradley. She wants him to just pay the ransom, but finding $50 million isn't exactly easy. Bradley figures she could use some help on swaying the bigwigs at UBA to pay up, so she goes and talks to Alex about it, but she's not totally honest with her. She doesn't bring up the video at all. And Alex, who at the moment is just stressed out about having to do the morning show five days a week, doesn't think this data breach is all that big of a deal. Because Alex hasn't thought about things like salacious videos, nudes leaking, text messages, and it leads Bradley to just walk out of the room, thinking that Alex only cares about herself. But it's not like Corey isn't working on it. As Bradley was talking to Alex, Corey was busy meeting with the board of directors to figure out what they were going to do about it. He's pretty sure he can get the hackers down from $50 million to $25 million. But the board of directors, led by Sybil, are very stern that they're not paying a dime. Leak whatever you want, but we're not giving in. And unlike Alex, they are fully aware of the Bradley video. Sybil basically puts all the blame on Bradley for recording the video and having the audacity to have it on her phone. When the meeting adjourns, Corey does go at Sybil in a very passive-aggressive way, and Sybil then decides to call him out on the fact that he's trying to sell the company that he doesn't actually own to Paul Marks. She reminds him that all merger and acquisition offers have to run through the board. Stella has the unfortunate news of then having to go tell Bradley about the fact they're not paying the ransom, and not only that, but because Laura's wrapped up in this, Their competition is going to break the news in the morning, which means UBA has to break the news that night. Because Bradley hosts the evening news, she's not only going to have to break the story, but once the deadline passes, she might become the story. A couple hours later, Bradley goes on, delivers the message, and just plays the waiting game. Two people that wait together to find out if the hackers are going to release everything are Corey and Stella, and Stella's upset. Because the first she heard about Paul Marks possibly buying UBA was in that meeting with Corey when Sybil brought it up. And she has a history in that field, big tech. She kind of warns Corey about getting in a bed with somebody like Paul Marks. But she's not telling the full story. Stella's not just from that world. She has a personal relationship with Paul Marks. They go way back. Corey, though, does not heed her advice. In fact, once Stella leaves, he hops on the phone and tells his fixer to leak a story about Paul Marks buying UBA. Hours go by, and still the hackers haven't released anything. It's a big relief to Bradley, who's sitting in her apartment when she gets a knock at the door, and it's Alex. Alex had quite a night. She showed up at home, only to discover that Chip is in a relationship with her assistant, Isabella. The two wanted to tell Alex they didn't know how to, and now the cat's out of the bag. But after that shock, she got another one when Laura called her up and told her about the whole story with the videotape and how it could leak. And Alex felt horrible. She had no idea. So she showed up at Bradley's trying to apologize for being so callous. She brought a bottle of wine, and she's going to help her through this. In episode three, the news about the UBA hack has UBA's rivals dancing on their grave. They're reveling in this. But it's not all bad news for Corey. Ratings are up. And after floating that Paul Marks was interested in buying UBA, UBA stock actually went up. So the value of the company goes up. But also... Corey's fixer went through every single leaked email, text, everything. And he found something salacious that his internal rival, Sybil, had to say about their new anchor, Christina Hunter. Corey knows it's only a matter of time before Sybil goes to the board and tries to get rid of him. So he decides to leak these emails, and they're downright racist. When news gets out about the racist emails, it sends shockwaves through UBA. The staff... And especially Christina, they're pretty floored to read them. You've got some people, though, that don't think it's that big of a deal. One of the people on the board of directors said that Chris is popular and she's on cereal boxes. And Sybil's reply to that was, well, so was Aunt Jemima, and you don't see people buying her anymore. And that was the whole firestorm. Because of the racial undertones, it's making for an uncomfortable environment for Chris. While Corey's the guy who started the fire, he also needs to kind of put it out. He meets with Chris and tries to get her not to sue the company, to keep it internally. 
offering her virtually hush money, a bonus here, a reworked contract. And that actually doesn't make Chris feel any better about the situation. She feels even more gross about the situation than she already did, which she didn't know was possible. While Corey was meeting with Chris, Sybil was meeting with Alex because she felt like she needed an ally. She needed somebody to go to bat for her who actually knew her. She thought that Alex could be that person because Alex was probably the most powerful person at UBA, even though Sybil is in charge of the board. But after how they recently handled Alex going back to the morning show, she's not keen to help Sybil at all. And she has no problem telling Sybil as much. Sybil tries to rope Alex in with sisterhood and unity and sticking up for one another, but Alex just ain't having it. At the moment, she could not care less about helping Sybil Reynolds. This meeting, though, does give Alex a pretty interesting idea. The next day, Chip and her meet with Stella and Corey and pitch the idea that Alex should interview Sybil on UBA+. Put it on Alex Unfiltered and have Sybil stand up for herself. Everybody likes looking at a car crash, and this would probably be one. Corey, though, doesn't want that to happen at all. He wants Sybil out. He doesn't want Sybil becoming humanized to the public. Right now, she's this evil woman in an ivory tower who's spitting racist emails, and that's the way Corey wants to keep it. His fear is that if Sybil goes on UBA Plus and looks sympathetic, then all of a sudden, Sybil stays in the chair. So when this idea gets brought to him, he pushes it down right away. But he pushes a little too hard. It's obvious to everybody in the room that he's shutting this idea down when it's a pretty good idea. And because of it, there's got to be some other reason. After this meeting, Stella gets a phone call from Mia. Mia's dealing with something a couple floors down. The staff is about to revolt. With this UBA leak, it's provided employees information that they probably shouldn't have, like performance reviews and salaries. And they've been able to connect some dots and figure out that they are wildly underpaid. One of the producers who is underpaid and is fed up and is kind of leading this revolt is Layla. Mia really trusts Layla. They've worked together for a long time, and Mia can tell that Layla is about to just blow. So she calls her in her office and says, hey, what's the deal? And Layla goes off. She complains to Mia that an email about a rich and famous person finally brought to light the inequality that's baked into UBA. And that's ridiculous, because it's been like this for a while. People underpaid, and more specifically, people of color underpaid. Mia asks Layla, how pissed are you guys? And Layla just says, you might not have a staff tomorrow. So Mia called up Stella to tell her, we need an all-hands-on-deck meeting. We need to put out this fire ASAP. A little while later, Mia and Stella stand up in front of the staff of the morning show, and they say, all right, tell us how you feel right now. What can we do to fix it? You're free to say anything without repercussions. And Layla laughs at that and says, yeah, okay, you're not going to fire us, but what you could do is... Things like take away segments from us or pass us over for promotions that we deserve to the point where we just get fed up and we quit. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. The meeting goes nowhere. Chris could see where this meeting was headed, so she started to walk out and Mia went after her. And Chris said, what was the point of that? Mia said to her, I thought it would help if everybody talked it out. And Chris shot back, oh, you mean before you put Sybil on Alex Unfiltered? She then walks off. After this failed meeting, Stella and Mia meet, and the staff aren't the only ones who are fed up with the situation. Mia vents to Stella about being put in the situation, because Stella is up in the penthouse of the building, talking to Corey, talking to Sybil. She doesn't have to look at these staffers who were overworked and underpaid. She resents being put in this situation. She compares UBA to a plantation with just dental insurance. And she hates the fact that she knows it, and yet she's still there. Stella knows that words are not going to make Mia feel better, so she decides to take her out and get drunk that night. And the plan is to invite Chris as well, but Chris isn't answering her cell phone at the moment. Chris is at home with her husband and her child, cute little baby girl, and she just doesn't feel like dealing with any calls or questions or texts or emails about work at the moment. But just because she's home doesn't mean she's in the clear, because there's a knock at the door, and it's work. Uh, More specifically, it's Alex Levy. Alex wanted to touch base with Chris, talk things out, try to make her feel better. And during their conversation, Chris decided I should be the one to interview Sybil. 
When she has this idea, she hops in an Uber, she heads down down, meets up with a drunk Mia and a drunk Stella, and tells them, I'm going to be the one to interview Sybil, not Alex. Mia and Stella are okay with the idea, but when they bring it to Corey the next day, he shoots it down. The morning show is supposed to be a fun place, not Frost Nixon. Corey tells Stella that he appreciates the Hail Mary attempt, though, and Stella says, you know, I appreciate Hail Marys, too, like where a network CEO leaks an embarrassing email to knock out his board chair and kind of casually weaponizes 400 years of racism. I I love that. And Stella says this, having no idea that Corey 12 hours ago was having dinner with a board member named Leonard, pitching him on getting Sybil out of UBA, having a vote of no confidence, and Corey wants Leonard to be the head of the board. Up until this point, Corey had thought he'd been a little sneaky with this, but apparently not, because Stella was on to him. Corey kind of has no choice but to agree to Chris interviewing Sybil. And of course, Sybil does not want that at all. She was comfortable with Alex, but having to look the person she was talking about in the face on live TV, it's a completely different ballgame that she didn't really sign up for. The big issue, though, is the statement that UBA put out came off really, really tone deaf. This could save the optics. If Sybil is able to conduct herself in a professional manner, it would go a long way to brushing this under the rug. It's worth mentioning, by the way, Sybil does feel really bad about this situation. She doesn't even remember writing it. She's angry at herself, but she's also angry at the situation. Ultimately, she does agree to go on the morning show with Chris. The next day, Sybil sits down with Chris Hunter for a very uncomfortable interview where Sybil bombs. Chris, on the other hand, shines, looking like a knight for those that are underpaid and overworked. She conducts herself both professionally, but also somebody that was pulling no punches on the boss. At times, the interview is just downright uncomfortable, but at the end of it, Sybil knows that her career is probably over, which is tough because Sybil's grandfather started UBA. She is literally the legacy in legacy media. When the interview finally wraps up, Mia turns to Layla and says, go in and congratulate Chris on doing a phenomenal job. And Layla can't figure out why she's getting charged with doing that. And Mia says, because that's what anchor producers do. This is long overdue. You're getting promoted. Mia wasn't about to sit back and wait for somebody else to do it. She's doing what the bosses should have done a long time ago. That night, the UBA directors meet and they vote Sybil Reynolds out. Leonard will indeed take over as chairman of the board. When this goes down, Corey is on cloud nine. With Sybil removed from the equation, he feels like this is a clear path between UBA being bought and Paul Marks. He finds out that Paul actually is in the city, and he goes to meet with him. But Paul's muscle, let's call her, a woman named Amanda who serves as an assistant, shuts down the meeting right away, telling Corey that he's not on the list to enter the building that Paul's in. But Paul sees him from the outside. He comes on out, and he tells him, Corey, I'm no longer interested in buying UBA. I've moved on. I wanted to buy a legacy media company. There's no legacy in UBA now. Legacy media companies have brand loyalty, and they're safe. UBA is no longer safe. UBA is a dumpster fire right now. I'm sorry, Corey. Thanks for coming by. And he leaves Corey sitting on the sidewalk, pondering what the hell he's going to do next. In episode four, UBA is having their big rollout of their new programming. It's like the big Apple event where they release the new iPhone. Well, that's what UBA is doing. Just like Tim Cook, Corey is going to be the headlining act, and he's going to get out there and tell you why you should subscribe to UBA+. But really what this is, is pitching ad execs on why they should spend their money with UBA. There's two particular ad execs that they're targeting. Because with Paul Marks out, they need ad exec money. It's going to be on Stella to get them to lock into a deal anywhere from two to $300 million. They get that, it could be the lifeline that UBA needs at the moment with no sale going through. After the event, Corey can't even get into his office yet before Alex is accosting him on a docu-series that she was planning on doing that hasn't been picked up yet. Finally, Corey breaks down and tells her, money right now is something that we don't have. Alex is pretty confused about this because she thought that they had a deal set up with Paul Marks 
Of course, is no. That deal is dead. Not after you cucked him on live TV. But if you want to help keep the lights on, we could really use you to woo some ad execs tonight. And he's bringing up tonight because that night, Corey Ellison is hosting a party with a bunch of other ad execs. Those two boys from Chicago that Stella's meeting, they're not the only ones who have a checkbook and deep pockets. Corey's trying to invite some of the other ones to his house for a party that's going to be very well attended with UBA talent. UBA, though, isn't the only one looking for ad dollars and having special events for it. NBN is doing the exact same thing. Instead of a party in the Hamptons, they're having this weird skating thing. And amazingly, it's supposed to be attended by Paul Marks, who seems to have pivoted from buying UBA to buying NBN. Even though these two companies are competing, there might be one common link, Laura Peterson. Now that her and Bradley are back in the news linked together, it's kind of brought them back together in a way. Bradley calls up Laura and starts joking with her and then invites her to Corey's party later that night. Laura tells Bradley she'll try to sneak away from the NBN event, but it seems like a pretty good chance that Laura Peterson will show up. Before the party, though, there's still work to be done. Mia found out about a bombing in Mario Pool that no one is sending coverage to. She knows it's going to be a big story, and she also knows that if they can get a photographer in there to cover it, It'll be big for UBA. Problem is, they need somebody to get the photographer in to Mario Pool. In a stroke of good luck, Bradley had just returned there a couple months ago. So she calls Bradley down and asks, do you have anybody who could help us out? And Bradley has just the guy. The only problem is this person doesn't really speak English. Not to worry, though. Turns out Mia speaks fluent Russian. Who knew? After getting the okay from the guy that he will end up getting the photographer in there for a fee, Mia FaceTimes her freelance journalist, Andre, and tells him he's got the all-clear to go in and cover the bombing. The thing is, this kind of has to be under wraps. He's got to assume all liability, and he can't say that he's working for UBA. Going into Mario Pool and covering this hospital bombing is very, very dangerous. But Andre knows the risks, and he's more than willing to take them. When she gets off the phone, Bradley starts teasing Mia because it's pretty clear that Mia has some kind of feelings for Andre. As Mia was trying to get Andre into Mario Pool, Corey was trying to keep UBA afloat. He met with two guys about a loan, a very substantial loan, and they're pretty blunt with them. They need ad commitment before they write this massive check. That's why it's so important that Corey end up getting some commitments from his Hamptons party, but also that Stella locked down the two brothers from Chicago. If they can pull together $300 million, then this other company will cut them alone, and they'll be able to save UBA for the time being. The next 24 hours are critical for Corey and UBA. Stella is certainly doing her part. These two brothers are the biggest douchebags you have ever come across. They're the kind of guys that wash Wolf of Wall Street, and were entertained, but instead were inspired. Yeah, sure, they have concerns about UBA, but they're more interested in just getting drunk and making Stella jump through hoops to get their money. But it's not just Stella they're affecting. It's also the bartender slash waitress that they're dealing with. The meeting gets to a point where the brothers offer Stella 150 k per primetime spot if Stella can get the waitress to lap up a drink that's spilled on the table. Instead of walking away right there, Stella gets the offer to $200,000, and the waitress will get a $20,000 tip for just licking up a drink off a table. But it's pretty demoralizing. I think anybody's licking up a drink for twenty k, so the waitress gets that tongue on the table, but it's just something that does not sit well with Stella, and she knows that she had to do it, but she's sick to her stomach about it. When she leaves the two brothers and goes off to the Hamptons, She's not feeling too good about the person she is. Either way, she texts Corey to let him know that the deal is closed, and then Corey texts the person with the loan that he's got the funding. This is great news for Corey, who's in the middle of his party, hosting talent from UBA, even though they're not thrilled about being there. Like, Chris Hunter doesn't want to be there at all. She's actually spent the majority of the party talking to the new board chairman, Leonard, and hammering him on the pay inequality which Leonard doesn't really have a great answer for. He kind of just toes the typical company line while trying to evade questioning. It's pretty clear to Chris, Leonard ain't committing to giving anybody a raise at this time. 
Bradley, though, also shows up, and she's not as miserable as Chris until she's instructed to go around and start talking to some of these ad execs, and let's just say the conversation lacks any substance at all. Bradley, though, is fortunately saved by Laura, who shows up just in the nick of time and can realize that Bradley is drowning in boredom. Bradley's pretty surprised that Laura showed up, but she's also thrilled that Laura showed up. They decide to walk around Corey's place, which, by the way, is massive, and explore it while getting away from these suits. They find Corey's bedroom, they start making fun of the decor, but then the conversation turns serious. Because the hackers for UBA posted everything, except one thing, and it was the video. Bradley assumes that Corey just paid the hackers to bury it. The conversation, however, gets a little bit awkward when Laura makes a joke that Bradley doesn't find funny. And let's just say there's still work to be done in this relationship and the whole mending process. They head downstairs to the party, and late that night, Mia finally hears from Andre. She's been stressed out all day because she hasn't heard from him, but he's made it to the hospital, and it's worse than they thought. He's still basically in a war zone. I mean, it's not like he's going to take pictures and leave. It's still in the process of being bombed. All he cares about is that Mia get the pictures he sent out to the public so they know what's going on. And all she cares about is him getting back safely. As Mia is heading back into the party after talking to Andre, so is Stella, who has just arrived, still shell-shocked at what she was able to do. When she goes inside, Corey tries to convince her that even though it might have been tough, she just saved a bunch of people's jobs. Now it's just a formality because all they have to do is sign the loan agreement, and they're good to go. UBA lives on to fight another day. As Corey is saying this, he's also surveilling the guests at the party, and he sees a familiar face that he doesn't want there. It's Fred Micklin. He walks over to Fred, and before he kicks him out, he starts passive-aggressively insulting him, reveling in the fact that Fred doesn't have a job. But Fred reveals to Corey that he does, in fact, have a job. He's been consulting with Sloan, the same people that are giving Corey the loan. If Corey wants money, he's going to have to get Fred's approval. This cold reality hits Corey like a freight train. He puts his tail between his legs and he just goes back into the house. He goes to find Stella and update her on the predicament they find themselves in. He's played out the scenarios in his head at this point. If they take this loan, it's only a matter of time before Maggie Brenner and the rest of the tabloids figure out that Fred Micklin is still taking part in UBA. At that point, they're going to be done. He has no idea what he's going to do. And then he gets a lifeline. Because everybody at the party hears a helicopter. And UBA's biggest star arrives via that helicopter. It's Alex Levy. She's late to the party because she was busy spending the entire day with Paul Marks. Trying to get him back to Corey and save the deal. In episode 5, you get to look at what happened to the employees of UBA during the pandemic. Because this starts out in March 2020. They all had to adapt to a completely new way of life, whether it be standing six feet from each other, whether it be doing their own hair and makeup. It was an adjustment period for all of them. Laura was doing the morning show with Bradley, but Laura was out in Montana, and she really wanted Bradley to come along. After a little bit of pushing, Bradley decided, you know what, yeah, it's time to move out of the hotel, and she's going to fly out to Montana, and it's going to be easier for UBA because they're both going to be in the same location. They're going to be quarantining alone, but they're also going to be doing the show together, so just one camera. It's a little bit awkward for Corey when he finds out about this, because it wasn't that long ago that he told her he loved her. So Bradley feels it necessary to let Corey know, you know, this isn't because of what you said. I'm going out there because uh, it's just what's best. At first, the trip out to Montana is great. But it's not long after she arrives that Bradley's past comes calling, Hal in particular, because Hal's still stuck in West Virginia, and Hal's also stuck with their mother. He's kind of pressuring Bradley to visit, but she explains to him that it doesn't really make a lot of sense at this moment, because when she gets there, she'd have to quarantine, and then she'd fly back to Montana and have to quarantine again. She promises Hal that she will visit once the restrictions are lifted, but at the moment, she's not coming to West Virginia. All in all, though, Hal is doing much better than the last time we saw him, when he was in a hospital bed after getting mugged. But Hal is still being judged, mainly by Laura. 
Laura makes a joke about Hal and how he didn't learn about science, clearly, because he's wanting Bradley to fly to West Virginia. And she doesn't take too kindly to it, because it is her family, after all. They get over the comment, though, fairly quickly, and spring then turns to summer. Things are going so well that they kind of decide to go public with their relationship. It's not an outright, hey, we're dating, but the comments that they make on the morning show make it very clear to the audience that they're not sleeping in separate beds. But as the months are going on, Bradley's getting more and more impatient. She's getting stir crazy. She kind of wants to leave, just get out of the house. Laura, on the other hand, is way more cautious with it. She's content with friends coming over. And there's plans on some of her friends coming over the next day. After Laura tells Bradley about this and leaves the room, Bradley gets a phone call from Hal telling Bradley that their mother has COVID. This is a huge deal because it's still at a time with no vaccine and the death toll for COVID is rising. Also, their mother is elderly. So you can imagine Bradley's concern when she gets this phone call from Hal. But Hal tries to put her mind at ease and say, Bradley, there's nothing you can do. I'll keep you updated. I just wanted to let you know. Bradley does feel like she should fly to West Virginia, see their mom, make sure she's okay. But Hal talks her out of it saying, what's the point of that? So you could possibly risk getting COVID too. So for the time being, Bradley says, stay put in Montana. The following day, though, Bradley gets a phone call that will change her life forever. As Laura and Bradley are entertaining some of Laura's friends, Hal rings her up and informs her that their mother has passed away. And Bradley is absolutely devastated. Yeah, she didn't have a good relationship with her mother, but it's still her mother. She feels a sense of guilt because her brother tried to convince her to come out to West Virginia to see them. And she just kept turning down the invitation. The fact she never got to say goodbye to her mom is eating at her. As summer turns to fall, the relationship between Bradley and Laura starts to deteriorate. The honeymoon period is completely over. It seems like every talking point starts a fight. Laura thinks that Bradley needs to talk to a therapist, but Bradley has absolutely no interest in talking to a therapist. She's just bottling up her emotions at the moment. Eventually, all that bottled up emotion boils over into the biggest fight that Bradley and Laura have ever had. It's centered around Bradley's mom dying and how Laura is happy when people like her die. And Laura gets tired of taking it and says, you know what, Bradley? I think there's a little piece of you that's happy that she died. There's no coming back from this type of fight. Bradley starts looking for an exit strategy to get out of Montana. She doesn't care what she's doing, what she's covering. She just wants out. She gets her opportunity with the January 6th insurrection. Bradley gets the okay from UBA Brass to go to Washington, D.C., but it turns into something completely different. She heads into the Capitol. She starts filming everything she sees. But then she sees something that she doesn't want to. As she's filming one of the insurrectionists fighting with a Capitol Police officer, the man looks up and Bradley sees that the man is Hal. She shuts the camera off, she grabs Hal, and they get the hell out of there. When they get back to Bradley's hotel, Hal is trying to explain why he was there, but there's no explanation for being in the Capitol if you're not a politician. Bradley's not quite sure what to do. She doesn't want to turn her brother in. With Bradley having just lost her mom, she can't imagine sending her brother to jail. So she gives him money for a bus ticket and says, you were never here. Bradley gets back to the UBA offices a short time later. She starts editing the footage and she decides to bury the video of Hal. This type of coverage will eventually earn her a Peabody Award. The thing is, the FBI, they don't forget. They start looking for information because they want all of these guys rounded up. So they're going to go to UBA because Bradley clearly had footage and they want to identify everybody. When the FBI starts asking, that's tough. I mean, what is Bradley to do? She has nowhere to turn, so she goes to Corey. Corey figures that it's just as simple as handing over the footage. I mean, what does Bradley have to hide? And that's when Bradley reveals what happened at the Capitol with Hal. Corey's entire mood changes. He's livid. He's so mad at Bradley for putting him in this position. But at the end of it, he's going to help Bradley out. He's going to give the FBI nothing. He's going to try to protect journalistic integrity. And he's going to basically say what we aired is what you get. But he never wants to speak of it again. When it rolls into the new year, 
The morning show is broken up, and Bradley is now doing evening news. Bradley and Laura are not the only relationship to be going strong during the pandemic, but towards the end of it fail. Mia is actually in a relationship with Andre Ford, the independent journalist. In March, it is thriving, but things take a turn when he heads out to a bar in the middle of a pandemic and risks bringing COVID back to her. Ultimately, he takes a job overseas and the relationship kind of goes their separate ways. So when it seemed like these two had a past earlier, it's because they do. Stella doesn't get in a relationship, but she does have an old friend stop by. It's her best friend from college named Kate. But not only were these two best friends in college, they also worked together at Hyperium. Kate seems absolutely miserable at Hyperium, and Stella understands why she used to work there. But unfortunately, Stella informs her there's nothing at UBA that she's really qualified for. In many ways, Kate seems jealous over Stella's decision to leave Hyperion behind. But it seems like Stella was the only one not to get in a relationship because even Corey found himself in a little bit of a fling. He also decided that he couldn't stay in the hotel forever. He wanted to buy a house. He bought a beautiful, palatial place in the Hamptons, and he ended up hooking up with his realtor. And I don't blame him because she was attractive. But with a huge place in the Hamptons, you're going to have some famous celebrity neighbors. And one of those neighbors ends up being Paul Marks. So that's how the two were first introduced. They live right down the beach from each other. In episode six, the deal between UBA and Paul Marks marches on. The shareholders have been recommended by the board to vote yes on a sale. But the sale doesn't come without the tractors. Many people think it's reckless and that a billionaire should not own a news division, which could be turned into a propaganda machine. It does, though, seem like a formality and that eventually Paul Marks will own UBA. So he heads to the office. He meets with the staff and he gives all of them a really nice speech about how they're very important and he's not planning on layoffs and he just wants to let them work. Just one of those speeches that it seems too good to be true. He then opens it up for questioning and Alex really hammers him on the fact that he owns Hyperion and how will they be able to report on Hyperion with an unbiased view. She thinks there might be a conflict of interest, but the questioning catches everybody off guard because it's just so direct. Paul just says that he's not going to decide what is and isn't news. That's Stella's job. After this meeting, Corey wants to meet with Alex because the line of questioning was weird. After all, she is the one who brought him back to UBA to get the deal done, and now she's hammering him on issues and wondering who the hell this guy is and what his motives are. She does admit that she might have done this whole thing a little hastily, but they just need to do their due diligence on the matter. The thing is, she wants to be the one to do that due diligence. She wants to interview Paul Marks on her show. Corey, however, pushes back big time. He spent two years trying to sell off UBA, at least that's what he claims, and they're basically at the finish line. He doesn't want Alex Levy messing it up. He understands that she wants to be at the grown-up table, but as he puts it, it's not your turn. He yells at Alex that they vetted him, and Alex tells Corey, well, I haven't. And then it gets awkward because Paul Marks actually shows up, interrupting the meeting and tabling the current conversation for later. Paul, though, is kind of just walking around UBA and meeting with some of the higher ops. Next person on his list after talking with Corey is his old colleague, Stella. They get a little bit into their background. When Stella worked for Paul, he told her that she wasn't cut out for tech, so she left and created her own startup. But Paul does take her off guard when he says, you know, you're one of the reasons I'm interested in this place. That's something Stella wasn't exactly expecting to hear. She then goes into what UBA could do better, and Paul's all ears. She then asks, why are you buying UBA, though? And Paul says, this place has been treading water since Corey took over, don't you think? And Stella simply says, we've had our challenges. And Paul asks, why are you covering for Corey? But then they get interrupted. Because Paul has another meeting on the books. Paul's next meeting is with his top talent, Alex Levy, a one-on-one. And that's when she asks him if she can interview him on Alex Unfiltered. The thing is, Paul doesn't really do interviews. He ironically doesn't really like the media. But Alex pitches him the idea, pitches him as to why it would be a good idea. And he ends up surprisingly accepting. They set a date, and Paul's willingness to do it takes Alex completely off guard. Alex then heads upstairs to her office to break the news to both Isabella and Chip that she's interviewing Paul Marks in two days 
and they're going to have to be the ones to prep. That's usually not enough time, but they don't have a choice in the matter. The first place that Chip heads is to Stella's office, because he knows that she passed cross with him back in Silicon Valley, so he figures to do background on Paul Marks, he would start there first. He asks Stella if she's ever heard any dirt regarding him, and she's pretty cagey with him. She claims that she barely knew him and she was still in school, but that's something that Chip doesn't really believe. He then tells her the reason why he's asking these questions, Alex and Paul's upcoming interview, and then he heads out to try to dig up some kind of dirt. A couple hours later, Chip returns along with Mia, and they're talking about the promotion of this interview, how they want to handle it. They go to Stella, but she's pacing in her office. Something is clearly bothering her. She's frazzled and not really paying attention. At one point, she snaps at both of them but realizes that that was a mistake. And then she asks Chip if he found any dirt, and Chip hasn't yet. It's not for lack of trying. He has looked. Just nothing's coming up. Chip and Mia then head out of Stella's office, but that thing that's eating at Stella, she has to tell Chip. So she pulls him off the elevator and says, we need to talk. She tells Chip that when she was a Stanford student working for Paul Marks, She ended up writing a code that Paul now uses and sells to governments throughout the world. Now, technically, the code that he does sell isn't Stella's code, but it might as well be Harvard Connect. He paid 50 grand for it and then forced Stella to sign an NDA because her original idea wasn't what Paul Marx turned it into, which was a sort of progressive policing tool. Guilt ended up building up inside of Stella until eventually she had a failed suicide attempt. Because of the NDA, Stella was pretty hesitant to tell Chip this, but she felt like word needed to get out. As Chip and Alex are preparing for their Thursday interview with Paul, Bradley has been entertaining some guests. Hal, his new fiancée Cheryl, and their new baby have come up to New York to pay Aunt Bradley a visit, and Bradley's really excited about this. So is Cheryl. Seems like it's her first time in New York. She can't wait to do sightseeing tours and whatnot. And Bradley is totally okay with being the tour guide. When they get into the Empire State Building, though, Hal tells Bradley the real reason he showed up. It's to turn himself in. He can't deal with the guilt of everything that happened on January 6th. He knows it's only a matter of time before the FBI finds him, so he'd rather do this now, when his daughter is young, than do it later. Bradley is stunned by this. She also thinks it's dumb. She did everything in her power to cover for Hal, and now he just wants to throw it all away. And selfishly, she knows that this could blow back on her if it comes out that she did cover for Hal. She flat out tells him, you can't do this. We need to put this behind us and move on. She knows that just by telling Hal he has to move on doesn't mean he's going to do it. She needs to make him understand that by doing this, he's making a terrible decision. She does this by setting up an interview with a guy that turned himself in on January 6th and now regrets it. So when Bradley gives Hal and Cheryl a tour of the studios, she makes sure that Hal is front row center to hear this insurrectionist talk about his experience after he turned himself in and what it did to him and his family's relationship. Spoiler alert, it wasn't good. The timing of that interview, though, isn't lost on Corey, who pays Bradley a visit and asks, hey, is this just a mere coincidence? And Bradley admits, no, it's not. Hal's thinking of turning himself in. But don't worry, I'm handling it. Corey then turns to Bradley and says, fix it or I will. That night, Bradley is going to have a dinner date with Laura. Laura starts off by giving some gossip on Audra. And then she wants to know about the drama that's going on with UBA and Paul Marks. Laura, though, can tell that Bradley's mind is not present at the moment. It's somewhere else. And Bradley says, yeah, it's just Hal's here with his kid and his fiance. She doesn't want to tell Laura the truth. When she gets home, she approaches Hal about not doing this, but he says, I have to do this. This starts a pretty big fight between the two. Nothing getting accomplished. The next night when Bradley does the news, she's still very distracted. She has trouble getting through stories. But as she's live on the news, Laura went to her apartment. Laura knew that Bradley wouldn't be there. She came to talk to Hal. She apologizes to Hal and admits that she encouraged Bradley to cut him out of her life. But she realizes that was a mistake, and she wants to be with Bradley. She's pretty sure Bradley wants that too. She asks Hal for support because she thinks it'll mean a lot to both Bradley and to her. And even though she was talking about the relationship, this was the moment that Hal realized he couldn't turn himself in. 
So while Bradley out, he writes a note saying he changed his mind and he's heading home. And home is where Paul Marks is waiting to do the interview with Alex Levy. And at first it starts out like a normal interview. Why do you want to buy UBA? And then she drops the bombshell about the, quote, Stanford student. And Paul knows who she's talking about. But what he didn't know was the suicide attempt. He handles himself, though, pretty well, defends his actions, and then they wrap up the interview. And when they're wrapping up, Chip and Isabella head off, and they leave both Alex and Paul to talk about what happened. Paul isn't mad about how the interview went down. In fact, he actually respects Alex more. He's just curious as to how she found out about the Stanford student, and she says, you know, I can't reveal my sources. They then hook up. A romance is blossoming, but as one romance is blossoming, another is ending. Because unfortunately, Isabella and Chip break up in the car ride home. But as that romance is ending, another is rekindling. The next day, Bradley rushes over to Laura's apartment, apologizes for dinner the previous night, and the two get back together. And as that relationship is rekindling, another relationship is mending, although this one isn't a romantic relationship. It's Paul and Stella. He doesn't apologize for what he did. He just says, you could have talked to me because I didn't know you felt like that. Stella feels like this is a good time to quit. She thinks it's for the best, but Paul says no. UBA needs somebody with a vision. I think that person is you. Look, the reality is Corey won't be here. He tells her that he's going to send her an offer for employment, and she will take Corey's job. And now Stella has a lot to think about. In episode 7, while Paul and Alex bang each other's brains out, Corey is ready to bang brains against the table because he wants his lawyers to close this deal ASAP. Normally, these things take a while because they have to read through fine print, make sure I's are dotted, T's are crossed, but he doesn't care about any of that. He just wants to sell this company off. When Corey leaves the office after yelling at all these lawyers, Leonard approaches him and starts saying, look, I know that you talked to her, but she's been calling the Justice Department every day, and I don't blame you. She's a legend. But if it doesn't stop, they're going to put us under review. Corey reassures Leonard that he will talk to this mystery woman, but all Leonard cares about is that Corey take care of this and shut this person down. Corey heads to his office to tell Kyle that all of his meetings need to be canceled. He's heading to the Hamptons for a quick meeting. And Kyle tells him he'll do it, but Bradley's currently in his office. Bradley wants to reassure Corey that everything with Hal is taken care of. And while that's music to Corey's ears... He just suddenly had an idea to bring Bradley along to this impromptu meeting. He thinks that it would help smooth things over. Bradley asks who exactly this meeting's with, and Corey tells her it's a political strategist who's making calls to the Department of Justice. She's commenting on the deal. Corey needs to convince her to stop. Woman means well, but they just don't need that kind of heat right now. It does sound a little suspect to Bradley, but Corey reassures her that they're going to be in, they're going to be out. And she'll be back in time to do the evening news. So she decides to go along with it. As Corey and Bradley head off, Corey's replacement is getting an offer. Amanda delivers Stella's offer directly to her. And then Stella takes it to her lawyers. It's for $14 million a year. But she still is hesitant to accept the deal and get back into bed with Paul Marks. She asks her lawyers to give her a timeline if she were to accept. First step would be countering. They would likely agree to those counter offers. Then they would quietly start to put together Corey's exit package. Then it would be a matter of Stella deciding who was to stay at UBA and who would be replaced. Stella's concern, though, is what happens if the deal gets out before she signs it, agrees to it. And her lawyer does admit that if Corey were to find out about the deal while he's still in charge, the situation would become untenable. But they reassure Stella they'd find her a safe place to land. Stella is not the only person at UBA who is extremely stressed out. So is Mia. Mia has been trying to get in touch with their contact overseas, the one that they paid to get Andre in Mariupol and out of Mariupol to no avail. But she finally gets him on the phone, and he acts extremely cursed with her. But Mia does get the answer. The guy didn't get Andre safely out of Mariupol. In fact, the guy doesn't even know where he is. Most of the staff at UBA, though, is getting ready for this red carpet appearance for a fashion show that is playing itself off as a charity gala. Most of the big talent will be there, sans Bradley, who's supposed to be doing the news. Alex and Paul also head there separately, 
and they're still trying to keep their relationship under wraps. A big reason for that is because the interview on Alex Unfiltered hasn't aired yet. While the talent is walking the red carpet, the two most stressed out individuals in the building meet up in the control room, Stella and Mia. And right away, Mia can tell there's something bothering Stella, so she says, come on, what's going on? First thing she does is tell Mia we are not having this conversation, but Paul is looking to make a change at the top, the very top. And while Stella doesn't come right out and say the name Corey, Mia can tell who she's talking about. But the reason why Stella is coming out to Mia about this isn't just because she needs to tell somebody. It's because if she were to take the position, she would want Mia to run the news division. A little bit of this conversation, though, does have to do with Stella's guilt. Because Corey's been really good to her and she doesn't want to stab him in the back. And Mia knows a little something about that. She had a really good relationship with Chip, but when Chip got fired, she had to seize that opportunity. She does, though, give Stella a little bit of a warning. That guys at the top do not give up those seats easily. Mia then leaves to head down and join her coworkers at the gala where a secret is about to get out. Alex is busy talking to Chris and her husband when she notices that Paul is on the phone and he's really stressed out. She goes to check on him and he says, yeah, well, the vault got a photo of us and it's pretty clear that we're together. I'm currently trying to bury it. Alex reminds Paul that the vault is that site that outed Bradley and Laura. They don't care. Paul's well aware of that, so he figures there's two options here. First one is they release a statement, owning it, saying they're together. The other option is just paying them off. Seems like that's probably the better option. So Paul's going to try to do that, and the party goes on. Upstairs, Stella is trying to get down to the party when she gets stopped by security because... Somebody is claiming to know her and wanting to talk to her, and they just don't know who this person is. They're not on the list. That person turns out to be her old college friend, Kate. Kate showed up because she got fired from Hyperion. Her and Paul had a, quote, philosophical disagreement. She's a little annoyed because not only did she lose her job, but she did call Stella a bunch of times, and Stella was blowing her off, not calling her back. Stella tries to justify it by saying, yeah, I've been really busy. I meant to call you back, but... Kate feels like it's something else. She feels like Stella's once again being wrapped up in the Paul Marks propaganda machine. She tries to remind her friend exactly what this guy put Stella through, what she was feeling like, and not only that, but who was there when Stella was at her lowest because of Paul Marks. Stella stands up for herself and says, look, I'm sorry you lost your job, but you need to stop blaming everybody else for everything that happened to you that's bad. Unfortunately, there's nothing I can do for you. Kate just shakes her head and says, I don't have a clue why I'm still trying to help you. And then she walks out. Stella's a little shook, but she heads down to the party where the party has been interrupted by breaking news. The Supreme Court is overturning Roe v. Wade. For the women, this really, really hits home, especially Chris Hunter. She's livid. She gets even more mad when she's in the bathroom and none of the other women seem to even care about it. So Chris decides to make a statement. She writes with lipstick on the mirror, abort the court, flips it off, and then posts the picture to Instagram. Now, while Chris was making political statements and Paul was trying to get rid of a picture, Bradley was not on the evening news because she had it along with Corey to meet that political strategist. But that political strategist isn't just anybody. It's Corey's mother. And boy, do they have a weird relationship. Maybe weird isn't the right term, but it's rocky. The woman is, in fact, a legend, and she worked with legendary figures. But the littlest thing seems to annoy her, and at the end of the night, she really, really puts Corey down, to the point where, as they're driving back from the Hamptons, as a friend, Bradley wants to console him, and he says, no, 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 it's fine. It just seems like Corey didn't have the most loving childhood. But it's on the ride back that they get word about the Roe v. Wade decision. Bradley prepares to do a breaking news segment about the SCOTUS leak and about the decision, While Corey does his typical positive spin job saying, women are going to be glued to the news. This is great for us. But as he's sitting in his office convincing himself of this, Stella walks in. She tells Corey about Chris' Instagram posts and how that's going to complicate things for them. But then she tells him what's been eating at her. The fact that after the deal goes through, Paul Marks is going to get rid of him and replace Corey with herself. Instead of getting mad at it, Corey just maniacally laughs to himself, saying, This day just is full of surprises. 
Stella tells Corey that she hasn't given Paul an answer, but there is an employment agreement sitting on her desk, just waiting to be signed. That's when Corey says to her, then sign it. I mean, if he came to you with an offer behind my back, it's because he thinks he can manipulate you. Let him think that, because it's not the first time that you've been underestimated around here. Stella poses the question, well, what happens after I sign it? Corey shrugs his shoulders and says, I don't know, keep an eye on him. Build up some trust. Then we see how it plays out. Not too far down the hall, Chip and Alex have gotten together because they need to plan on a Roe v. Wade segment themselves. Chip heads out to get working on the story, and in walks Paul. He realized that the story is really big, but he also wants to talk about the photo leak. Somehow, in the course of, quote, talking about the photo, they start hooking up. But it's an office that people can see into, and even though it's nighttime, people are still in the building. One of those people is Chip, who forgot something in that office, and when he walks back, he sees Alex making out with the new guy. Well, in episode 8, the tabloids are all a buzz, and it all has to do with UVA. We'll start out with Chris Hunter. Her Instagram post made a lot of waves. So much so that when she's walking to the office, somebody yells baby killer and throws a bunch of fake blood on her coat. It's gotten to the point where they have to take Chris off of SCOTUS coverage because after the morning show airs that day, they get death threats. So they're going to take her off the coverage and they're going to give her some security detail just to make sure that no whack job ends up attacking her on the street. Then there's the vault. Paul Marks couldn't buy that photo, so they released it. Now, everybody in the world knows who Alex is sleeping with. Her boss. That doesn't stop UBA Plus from promoting their interview with Paul Marks, where nothing's, quote, off the table. Yeah, the joke just kind of writes itself. Because of this story getting out, though, Chip is having a really tough time booking guests for Alex's show. And she, in turn, is giving Chip a hard time because booking guests is his job. But you've got NBN convincing people that right now, going on Alex Levy is a joke. The PR department of UBA has drafted up a statement that they do want Alex to put out, but Alex is adamant she's not going to put out a statement about her personal life. Not at this time. The problem is the shareholder vote is coming up. So they really, really would like her to, but she's adamant, no, I'm not doing it. She tells Chip that it's a no-go and to get back to doing his job. And then there's a story that hasn't leaked out yet. It's a story of what's going on at UBA all the way at the top, with Stella possibly taking Corey's job. As both of them sit in Corey's office discussing the Alex and Paul scandal, Stella tells Corey that she's pretty sure something's going on at Hyperion, something that Paul Marks wants to keep under wraps. The thing is, Stella doesn't really know what it is, and because of that, Corey doubles down on closing this deal with Paul Marks. And yes, while that would mean the death of Corey at UBA, he also knows he has a $150 million buyout, so he might be too expensive to actually fire. Stella, however, isn't about to just sit back and allow the sale to go through. She wants to get proof of what Paul is trying to hide. So she tries to contact Kate, but to no avail. Kate's sending every call straight to voicemail, and Stella's just having a hard time getting in touch with her old friend. Because of all of that, she doesn't want to accept Paul's offer, which is becoming a little bit of an issue for Paul, or at least his lackey, Amanda, because Paul wants to get the team in place before the shareholder vote. Ideally, Paul would like the team to be in place, shareholder vote to go through, sale to go through, Corey out, Paul's team moves in. The only person stopping that from happening at this point is Stella, who's hemming and hawing at the agreement. Once Stella dodges Amanda... She heads to Bradley's office because Stella isn't getting anywhere trying to contact Kate. She figures that maybe Bradley will. She explains everything that happened with Kate showing up at the office and the fact that she thinks there's something Paul Marks is hiding. And she does this because this is kind of Bradley's wheelhouse. She loves this investigative journalist stuff. But Bradley is hesitant to do it. All because the last time she pushed a woman to talk about her trauma, it was Hannah. Stella tries to remind Bradley that what happened with Hannah is not her fault, but either way, Bradley doesn't want to go down that road again. Stella, though, implores her. She tells her that she's not sure whether Kate wants to be a whistleblower or not, but she writes down her phone number, hands it to Bradley, and reminds her that what she did with the Hannah Schoenfeld situation, that was the right thing, because ultimately she held those men accountable for what they did. She then asks her to call Kate, 
and she gets up and leaves it up to Bradley. This works because when Bradley gets home that night, she decides to call Kate up. But once Bradley identifies herself, Kate just says, oh, uh, wrong number, and hangs up, not wanting to talk to a reporter. So Bradley is back to square one. She's also got another issue that she hasn't even thought of. It's her relationship. Her and Laura are back together, but once she told Laura about going and meeting with Corey's mother, Laura got weird. She still thinks that there's something going on between Bradley and Corey. As she put it, I've never been taken by my boss to meet his mother. So the next day, when Laura's at work, Audra kind of probes for information regarding their relationship, and when she hears that story, she tells Laura that Laura has to go through Bradley's phone. She's got to find a definitive answer whether or not there is something going on with Bradley and with Corey. Now, Laura doesn't want to do that. It's an invasion of privacy, but she still is really curious as to what happened, if anything, that is. Both women, though, have to get ready for that day's programming of YDA, and they just so happen to have a photojournalist on, Andre Ford. Over at the morning show, Mia is talking to Layla about what they're going to do regarding the Chris Hunter situation. She's got to eventually report on SCOTUS. But then Mia gets distracted because on the screen, she sees a familiar face. It's Andre, over at YDA. And she heads over to the rival studios to catch him as he's leaving. She's annoyed that he appeared on the rival show, but she's more annoyed with the fact that he's in New York and he didn't call, he didn't text, he didn't reach out. She was so worried about him when he was overseas and she can't believe that he didn't reach out to say that he was okay. At the heart of this, though, it's their relationship. And she yells at him, telling him that he's a middle-aged adrenaline junkie that would rather bounce between wars than simply commit to a zip code. She leaves him in the lobby and walks back to UBA. Over at UBA, though, Andre Ford isn't even a blip on the radar for Corey. It's more to do with this interview coming up with Alex and Paul. He and Chip decided to edit it, and he heads over to Alex's office to get the okay, but she tells him, yeah, I'm bumping it. We just got an interview with the head of Planned Parenthood, and with everything going on, it's probably for the best. Corey doesn't want to bump it. They've been running promos for it all week, and they had the shareholder meeting at the end of the week. If they pull the interview now... It makes the situation look even worse. Alex, however, wants to cover, as she puts it, the most important story for women in the last 50 years. And this starts a bit of a fight between the two. It ends with Alex winning this round, Corey giving up and telling her that they'll run the interview next week. He does, however, give her a bit of a cold dose of reality when he says that she's about to get everything she wants and instead she's giving it up to be Paul Marks' plus one which means that every decision she makes is going to be ripped apart and scrutinized by not only the public, but by people in the building. Now, you might be wondering where Paul is in this whole situation. He's back in Houston. He's got an engine test to deal with. So all of this really is falling on Alex at the moment. Paul's busy being Rocket Man. It goes from bad to worse for Alex, because the next day when she comes in the office, Chip has to inform her that the CEO of Planned Parenthood dropped out. Chip, though, does have a backup plan. It's somebody named Jess Bennett. She's the co-founder of an online magazine. We call that a blog called The Break. She was the first one to predict the end of Roe. It's an interesting angle, and Alex decides it's probably the best way to go. So Alex reluctantly okays it. When she actually sits down with the girl, though, it does not go the way she planned. Yeah, it starts off with Roe v. Wade, but it ends up with Jess Bennett grilling Alex Levy about her situation with Paul Marks. Whether or not the public can actually trust Alex at this point to do fair journalism. Alex tries to remind the woman that she is not the news this week. It's about millions of women losing control of their bodies. But Jess says, yeah, you just proved my point. The news is whatever you and Paul Marks decide it is. When the interview wraps up, Alex rips into Chip. But Chip doesn't apologize. He actually says that Jess brought up some points that a lot of people probably wanted answered. This starts a huge fight between the two, with Chip wanting Alex to take some responsibility for what she did, and Alex's hubris getting in the way of that. The conversation gets really, really personal, really, really contentious, and it ends with Alex firing Chip. Chip is pretty stunned, so before he leaves, he tells Alex that when he came over to her apartment and said that he had COVID, he didn't. He just knew in that moment that she needed him, and he was there for her. 
Now, if she wants somebody by her side, she can look to Paul Marks. And then he leaves. But Paul Marks is really distracted because the launch that he was preparing for did not go well. He looks like hell. He's been drinking to numb the pain. And that's because he thinks that NASA is going to pull out of their agreement. Fact is, Hyperion just isn't ready. He's got to get it together quickly, though, because he has a photo shoot with Corey. While in the photos they look friendly and cordial, it's not that way at all. In between shots, they throw barbs at each other. And most of it is coming from Corey, who tells Paul that if he buys UBA, which is the plan, he's in way over his head, and he needs somebody like Corey. Because Paul Marks is not ready for the crap that's about to come when you buy a legacy media company. When they're done with the photo shoot, Paul tells Amanda that he thinks he's found a problem for their cash flow, which could save the Hyperion launch and save the NASA deal. He's just got to run some numbers. She also has some news for him. When they fired Kate, she told them that she was going to Palo Alto, but they found out she actually flew to New York. She's been trying to get in touch with Kate because Kate could be a big problem for them, but it's been to no avail. While they haven't had luck, Bradley has. Surprisingly, Kate reached out to Bradley via a Starbucks order, and they met in the parking lot. I mean, we're talking deep throat style. It's a really quick meeting. Kate just gives her a location to meet up and says, tomorrow I'll tell you everything I know about Iberian. Unfortunately, though, when Bradley goes there, Kate never shows up. Bradley heads back to the office. She gets a phone call from Laura informing her that she's not at Bradley's place. She's, quote, not feeling well. Bradley thinks that Laura's just feeling under the weather, but Laura's not feeling well because curiosity got the best of her. She looked into the UBA leak, which had all of the text messages, and she searched the text messages between Corey and Bradley. And what she first thought was an affair turned out to be a bunch of dots. And when you connected those dots, Laura was able to figure out that Bradley covered for Hal with the January 6th insurrection, and she's disgusted. Bradley has no idea about this. And the reason why she headed back to the office is because her and a couple of her coworkers are having a ceremonial toast in remembrance of Hannah. It's the anniversary of her death. One of those people is Chip, and he does inform people that he was let go by Alex, but he's not trying to make it about him. In the moment, it's all about Hannah. Another person that was there was Mia, who before she joined her coworkers was sitting in her office when she got a knock on the door, and it was Andre. He feels bad about what he did. He came to apologize and possibly try again with her because he does miss her. But that's not something Mia is interested in because deep down she knows that she's not going to change for him. He's not going to change for her. So they give each other a hug and go their separate ways. One person, though, that did not show up at the Hannah Toast was Alex. She was at home waiting for Paul to show up. And when he does, they both talk about their crappy days. Paul then pitches Alex on an idea he had. Once the sale goes through, he's going to gut UBA, sell off all their assets and start over again. He pitches it like they're going to build something from the ground up the way they want, when in reality, all he cares about is selling off UB assets for cash to fund his Iperion mission. And he's already started the process because he's got Amanda gauging interest in all the UBA properties. And the person that Amanda's talking to is Fred Micklin, telling Alex... It's kind of just bracing her for the inevitable. In episode 9, Alex woke up the next morning and she felt guilty. Felt guilty about what her and Paul Marks might do to a legacy media company like UBA. Paul tries to explain to her that she doesn't need to feel guilty. It's not like UBA gave her a career. She gave herself a career. He pitches Alex on the idea that she will be able to run her own studio the way that she wants. Create something from the ground floor. But as those two discuss tearing down UBA, not too far away in Bradley's apartment, Bradley, Chip, and Stella have congregated to tear Paul Marks down. They've been contacting former Hyperion workers about their relationship with Paul Marks, what was going on in Hyperion, and every single one of them have been nervous on the phone and cagey as hell. Through doing some digging, Bradley found out that a lot of Hyperion's researchers have left in the last couple months. It's been like an exodus. Unfortunately, though, she can't get anybody on the record to say what happened. They're all spooked. Stella is extremely stressed out about this because they're running out of time. And as she puts it, once the sale goes through, anything they find out about Paul Marks will just make them feel worse that he's now their boss. The deal, though, might just be in jeopardy. 
At the UBA office, Corey's excited about the Forbes magazine cover when his fixer comes in because there's some weird trading activity going on regarding the UBA stock. It has shot up. I'm talking Elon Musk Dogecoin shoot up to the moon. And the problem is the fixer has no idea who's driving up this stock. Corey tells him that he's got four days to close this deal. So find out who is driving up the stock price so they can fix it. A couple hours later, the fixer calls Corey and says the only thing he's been able to confirm is that it's one single buyer, not a bunch of them. Corey goes and tracks down Paul to ask him if he knows anything about this one particular buyer, but Paul doesn't, nor does he really care. He looks at him buying UBA as just a formality because at this point they have the votes, so he's not worried about it, even though Corey is. Corey heads back to his office to try to find out who this particular buyer is. Down at Alex's office, she gets an unlikely visitor. It's Maggie Brenner. Maggie's out of the industry, but she just wanted to stop by, say hello, congratulate Alex on the success that she's made for herself. And while Alex is a little weirded out by this drop-in, she does ask Maggie her opinion on what happens when the UBA deal goes through with media. And Maggie's best guess is that the three networks just cannibalize each other, and then they die off. She is very complimentary, though, of Alex and says that no matter what happens with UBA or the other news companies, Alex will be successful because she's always been successful. Hours later, after everybody's gone, Alex is still in the office and she runs into her old co-anchor, Bradley. She confides in Bradley that once this deal goes through, she wants to start her own thing. It's completely new and she wants Bradley to be a part of it. Bradley's a little confused because of Alex's relationship with Paul and also the fact that they talked about making change at UBA. Alex tells her that that's still the plan, but if they're at UBA, they're always going to be under somebody. This way, they'll be the bosses. She points out that her show can be recut by Corey whenever he wants, and Bradley's on the evening news, but she can't report on abortion. She kind of pitches Bradley the same pitch that Paul gave her in the morning about starting something from the ground up. This offer takes Bradley pretty off guard. She does appreciate it. But she lets Alex know that she still has work to do at UBA. And she also says she believes the wrong guy is buying it. And that comment takes Alex off guard. She asks Bradley, what do you mean by that comment? And Bradley says, well, something happened at Hyperion. I mean, people are really pissed at Paul. They're just not talking. The more that Bradley talks, the more Alex is kind of getting upset about it. Until finally Bradley asks, how well do you even know this guy? And suddenly this friendly conversation turns contentious. Alex looks at it like it's a $40 billion deal. Of course, people are going to come out of the woodwork and talk crap about somebody. But Bradley believes that it's way more than that, that there's truth behind those comments. Alex ends up walking out of the room because it's clear that she's taking these comments as a personal attack. Of course, what Bradley's saying is accurate. Because Alex was in the office, she wasn't at home when Paul got the call from Amanda, letting her know that Fred Micklin did dive into the numbers And if Paul were to sell off all of UBA's assets, he'd make a $10 billion profit. To which Paul says, great, that'll keep Hyperion afloat. She also informs him that she knows Bradley is snooping around. And Paul tells Amanda, just keep an eye on it. But as Bradley's snooping around Paul, Paul's demanding that Amanda snoop around Corey, try to find some dirt, which is becoming nearly impossible to do. He doesn't really have any. Paul, though, is confident that Amanda will find some, so he tells her just keep digging. A little while later, when Alex does finally return home, unaware of the conversations that Paul was having, she tells Paul that she's ready to do it. She's ready to leave UBA and start this thing from the ground floor. Hitch her wagon to Paul Marks. The next morning, Bradley and Stella bring their concerns to Corey about Hyperion and what's going on, but Much like Alex, he just dispels it because he really wants this deal to go through. He doesn't care that Paul Marks is planning on firing him. Stella brings up the fact that she has a friend who was a longtime engineer and she brought up safety concerns about Hyperion and then she was fired. And someone is silencing her because she wanted to talk, but suddenly she's gone dark. Still, Corey doesn't really care. In an attempt to get through to him, Stella says, well, did you hear about the transmission failure during the launch? And Corey had not. She informs them that when they did a deep dive into the situation, they found out the transmission loss was actually on Hyperion's end, not on UBA's. 
And all Paul Marks did was use the cyber attack as an excuse to blame UBA for his mistake. That mistake could have been deadly, but Corey still doesn't seem to care. Stella is so annoyed with Corey that she stands up and tells him that he makes people feel like anything is possible. It's one of the reasons she took the job, and Paul Marks does the same thing. But the difference, at least she thought, was that Paul Marks, it's BS. She thought Corey was being true. But it turns out they're just the same person. And it's not his fault because he got infected by Paul Marks. And after the deal goes through, she's not planning on being there. But what Corey doesn't know is there's a good chance he's not there. And I'm not talking about Paul Marks wanting to fire him. I'm talking about the dirt that Amanda dug up on Corey. She found pictures of Corey and a very compromised Bradley heading up in the elevator of the hotel. Now, we know what happened, but the look of it is he's about to take advantage of her. As for Bradley, she had to run off because she had a text message from Laura saying, we need to talk. The whole situation regarding Bradley covering up what happened at the Capitol has been eating at Laura. She's confided in friends about what to do. She even called Hal. But finally, she realized she just had to face Bradley and tell her that she knew what she did. She's completely disgusted in Bradley's behavior. She doesn't even want to be with her anymore. And Bradley is distraught. She wants to explain herself, but to Laura, there is nothing to explain. What she did was reprehensible. At the end of their conversation, Laura proclaims that she wants nothing to do with Bradley, and she's done with her. The next day, with two days before the sale of UBA to Paul Marks, in walks the old owner, Sybil. Corey kind of pokes fun at the fact that she's about to lose her family's company, but it's her who's going to have the last laugh. She's still working on getting the votes to shut the sale down, but in the meantime... She ran into Fred Micklin's wife, and she found out that Paul Marks is going to strip the company for parts and that Fred is helping him do it. Because of that, Sybil was the one who was trying to buy the stock and raise the price. This revelation floors Corey. He tries to get in touch with Paul to no luck, so he takes the elevator down to visit Paul's girlfriend. He asks Alex if she's a part of this, and Alex just says, a a part of what? And Corey shakes his head and says, oh, of course you are. He goes off on a legendary rant, blaming both Alex and her boyfriend for trying to destroy what he feels like he built up. And when he's done, Alex throws the blame back on Corey because in the end, he didn't give her a seat at the table. He's also the guy who said, hey, you got to get on board with Paul Marks. This ship is sinking. So she did it. The fact is, there is nothing to save. She then informs him that she will be starting her own thing and she will bring everybody of value with her and she will pay them what they deserve. As soon as he gets out of Alex's office, Corey calls up Leonard to try to scrounge up an emergency board meeting and shut this thing down. Alex calls up Paul Marks to inform him about the conversation she just had with Corey. But Paul isn't worried about any of it. He has his driver send him to UBA, but it's not to talk to Alex or to Corey. The first person he wants to talk to is Bradley. He sits down with her right before she goes on the evening news and he says, well, I just want to let you know, I know that you're investigating Hyperion. And then he blackmails her into shutting up because Paul knows everything about the Capitol, about who knows about the Capitol, and it has Bradley shook. The message from Paul is clear. Stop investigating my company or the news about what you did for your brother is going to get out and everybody you care about will be ruined. Bradley is so shook that in the middle of the evening news broadcast, she resigns. Bradley walks out and doesn't answer a single question about why she's doing what she's doing. And while this has nothing to do with her relationship with Corey, it sure seems like that. Because at the worst timing possible, the vault drops that picture that Amanda found. The picture with Corey and Bradley. And the picture they're painting is that he was grooming Bradley. As Stella is showing Corey this photo, Kyle walks in and says that he's been informed security is to come upstairs and escort Corey out of the building. And in the season finale, Corey heads to Bradley's apartment to find out what the hell is going on. And she tells him, Corey, Paul knows. She's crying, just telling him, go away, leave me alone. So Corey does just that, respecting her wishes. But this whole Bradley situation is big news everywhere. When Paul arrives back at his apartment with Alex, he says, you saw what happened, right? Do you have any idea what's going on? And Alex has no idea. 
She brings up how it must be something to do with the article regarding Corey, and Paul says, yeah, well, he had to be shut down. And Alex realizes that it was Paul who planted the article. Alex knows that Corey is a lot of things, but a sexual predator? That's something he's not. She thinks this is just stooping way, way too low. And she's not just thinking about Corey, she's also thinking about Bradley and how it affected her. Having no idea that Bradley resigned because of a completely different issue. Paul finally reveals to Alex that he found out from a friend at the FBI there might be leveling charges against Bradley and her brother for covering up evidence regarding the insurrection. And that's quite a surprise to Alex. She can't believe that Paul knew this and didn't come to her first and talk about it. But Paul points out that if he had talked to her, then what? I mean, they had to do something about it. If this got out, it could cause mistrust with the public. The trickle-down could even affect Alex because she's the one who brought Bradley in. The more that Paul talks, the more he's making a lot of sense to Alex. The next day, the Bradley resignation, along with the Corey photo, is all that the other news stations are talking about. Leonard informs Corey that they're going to have to do a private investigation of the matter. It's not like Leonard believes it, but they still have to look into it. Corey's confident that once they do look into this, they'll find out the real truth that nothing happened. His bigger concern is Leonard allowing the board to let Paul Marks sell off UBA. So he pleads with them, don't allow this sale to go through. But Leonard is ready to just wash his hands of UBA. He's ready to do the sale and let Paul Marks do whatever the hell he wants with it. Corey isn't willing to go down, though, without a fight. He decides to call his old enemy, now turned ally, Sybil. Corey and Sybil aren't the only ones that don't want Paul Marks' hands on UBA. Neither does his staff. With Stella ready to walk out herself, she decides to tell Mia about the situation, and Mia tells the staff, and they're ready to walk out. Chris brings up just breaking the story, but Stella has to tell her we don't have enough information. Bradley was working the Hyperion story, and our whistleblower has gone silent. Unfortunately, nobody's going on the record. Chris doesn't so much even care about that. She cares about the 20,000 employees at UBA who might find out tomorrow they're not going to have a job. They deserve to know what's at stake with this board vote. Mia says they can do that. They just need the right guest. So they're going to think on it. As they're trying to think of who the right guest could be, Alex is trying to get in touch with Bradley to no luck, so she just decides to go over to her apartment. Now that she knows the truth, she wants to talk to her about it. It starts out with the typical, how could you be so stupid? I didn't have a choice. He's my brother. But then it goes into Paul. Because one thing that's been bothering Bradley is how exactly Paul knew about it. And it's not so much a shock that somebody figured it out because Laura figured it out. What really surprised Bradley was what Paul said. Because he knew that Laura had already confronted her about the issue. So it's not just that Paul knew. It's that Paul knew exactly what Laura said to her verbatim. Alex asks, you think he's surveilling you? And Bradley says, yeah, I think he's been surveilling us. All of us. She pleads with Alex to step in and try to stop this sale, mentioning how Stella started pulling threads and there's something there, something that Paul's hiding. On the drive home, Alex is pretty conflicted on what to do. She gets a text from Paul Mark saying, you coming home soon? I can cancel if tonight's not good. But instead of immediately responding, she opens up her cell and she texts Bradley. You're right. Get away from all this. Go back to West Virginia. At least she has it typed out. But then she decides to test this theory by deleting West Virginia and instead writing Hanover. A little while later, she arrives back at the apartment. There's Paul Marks. And as they make small talk, Paul mentions how Bradley's probably going to go back to Hanover. It proves Bradley's point. Not only was Paul Marks surveilling Bradley, he's been surveilling Alex, and Lord only knows who else he's been surveilling. Alex feels completely sick to her stomach regarding this issue. She's not quite sure what to do or how she's going to stop the vote, but her old show at least has a plan. They've found a guest to go on the record and talk about Paul Marks. It's going to be Alex's former producer, Chip. Chip blows the whistle on the fact that Paul Marks is going to dismantle the place if the shareholders vote yes to the sale. He gets really animated, he curses a bunch, but really, who cares? It actually will help because the clip will end up going viral. At the end of it, he looks in the camera and says, Paul, you are killing an 80-year-old media company. This station started as a radio station warning people about the dangers of fascism. 
And then it's a bunch of curse words and FUs and all that. But it works because Chip Black's meltdown is all anyone's talking about. And more importantly, it's starting to sway votes. Sybil's been able to get some votes on her side, and Corey's been able to get some votes on his side. But getting the votes isn't enough. Corey needs capital. He went back to that loan that he had on the table, the one that he walked away from because of Fred Micklin. Well, he went back to that guy, and he let him know that he's interested in the loan again, and he sweetens the deal. Now, initially, the banker isn't really interested in doing it until Corey tells him, yeah, well, your buddy Fred Micklin, he was helping Paul Marks scavenge this place for spare parts. He's working both sides of you guys. And when this venture capitalist hears that, he decides, you know what? Yeah, Corey, you get the votes. I'll give you the loan. Corey's so confident that he will end up pulling this through that he has his fixer draw up the loan agreement because he's meeting with the venture capitalist that night at a hotel. But when he shows up that night to get the deal signed, the fixer isn't there. The venture capitalist isn't there. Paul Marks is there. He was able to get to both of them. This seems like a death nail in Corey's attempt to save UBA. Paul tells him it's nothing personal. In fact, when the sale goes through, he'll make sure to say the investigation into the sexual harassment between Corey and Bradley was absolutely nothing. He's also willing to give him a $10 million buyout. Of course, it would have to involve an NDA, a really good one. Corey isn't going to accept it, though. He tells Paul to take his offer and shove it, and he walks out. He knows that by doing this, stuff's going to come out about him that's going to portray him as a monster. Some of it will be true, but some of it won't be. In the end, it's not going to matter. Paul Marks is going to have control of UBA. Corey's going to be out of a job. The next day, the shareholders' vote seems like nothing more than a formality. Until Alex Levy shows up. She shocks everybody. Nobody more than Paul. Because she has another offer to bring to the board. It's a merger between NBN and UBA. Alex, realizing she had to do something to stop this, went to talk to Laura Peterson. Laura, being basically the Alex Levy of NBN, had the cachet to go up to the boss and propose this merger. Instead of both stations eventually dying off, they would merge forces and be one. Alex decides to let the board look over the offer and leave the room, and Paul follows after her, yelling, is this a stunt? But Alex says, no, it's not a stunt. Alex leads him right into the control room where there, standing in front of him, is Kate, because Stella was finally able to get in touch with her friend. Stella tells him that they're aware he told Kate to cut the transmission on the launch. They buried the results, and they used a hack at UBA to cover his tracks. Kate then chimes in that Paul has been reporting fake data to NASA for months, and when she told him that a longer space flight could be lethal, she was fired. Paul decides to turn to his attention just to Alex and says, what do you want? And the two go talk privately. She yells at him, do I have to spell this out for you? You surveilled Bradley and then blackmailed her into resigning. Just walk away from UBA right now and make it right with the people you hurt. Come clean to NASA or we're running the story and ending Hyperion. Paul is forced to do just that. His hands are tied. In the end, he loses majority share of his company. And UBA lives on. Unfortunately, the morning show will be going on without Chris Hunter. She got her dream job at ESPN. It's probably going to be going on without some other people, too, because once the merger goes through, they're not going to need two morning shows, two producers, two heads of departments, yada, yada, yada. No word on whether or not Bradley or Corey are staying at UBA. They have to go through their investigation, but they'll both be cleared. They actually run into each other as they're coming and going from the meeting with the investigation, and... They say hi to each other, and I'll see you when I see you. But while Bradley doesn't know if she's going back to UBA, she does know that she has to make something right and clean her conscience. It's the fact that she hid evidence. So with Alex by her side, she meets up with Paul at the FBI office of New York, and she heads inside. And that is the end of Season 3 of The Morning Show. Thank you so much for getting this part of the recap. I do appreciate it. Consider subscribing to my channel. Hit thumbs up if you like this video. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. Let me know if you liked this season or not and where you think season four will go. Also, I have merch. I have a Patreon. I have all that crap. Just, you know, plenty of opportunity for you to spend money and, you know, uh, pay my bills. That'd be cool.